Between 1980 and 1989, four people between two young families would die, suddenly, of leukemia. The connection? They all lived in the same apartment inside a hastily built building in modern-day Ukraine. Within the walls of that apartment, one of history's deadliest orphan sources. This is the true story of the radiological accident in Kramatorsk. Before the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, its economy did. After a few decades of rapid economic growth, the communist conglomerate swiftly stagnated in the 1970s and 80s. By that point, it had borrowed all the modernizing economic models from the West that it could. It was prioritizing heavy industry at the expense of consumer goods. By 1980, the standard of living in the Soviet Union was declining. At the same time, the Soviets were making a mad dash to put on a more prosperous face for the 1980 Summer Olympics, which Moscow was hosting. The games were to be a statement to the West that communism works, and so party leaders went back to what got them a 5% growth rate after World War II. Rapid expansion. This was the backdrop for a stone quarry in the Donetsk region of modern-day Ukraine. Workers there were tasked with providing a huge amount of basic building resources and quickly. The West was not to see that the standard of living for the average man in the Soviet Union was just a third of what it was in America. Free apartments with hot water and an elevator? Isn't communism grand? As the Olympics got closer, whole towns sprung up from nothing. The materials for those towns came from quarries like these and from tired workers under incredible pressure. Workers liable to make a mistake. Cesium-137 is an intensely radioactive isotope. It's infamous for being the chief contaminant in the Chernobyl and Fukushima exclusion zones, but it has many far less problematic applications. In small amounts, Cesium-137 can power atomic clocks, calibrate Geiger counters, sterilize food and medical equipment, and treat cancer. In a certain quarry in the Soviet Union in the late 1970s, a capsule of cesium was being used in a gauge that judges the thickness of compacted materials like soil and asphalt. A nuclear gauge is then sort of like an x-ray machine, but instead of getting an image back, you get a depth or thickness, which the device calculates by measuring the amount of radiation it receives from its source, which is inside a shielded rod and lowered into the material in question. That source is usually locked inside the gauge when not in use. The Olympics was close. The Soviet Union had a statement to make. Any work stoppage in the quarries meant that a party ticket had to be made, and someone would have to answer for it. This pressure cooker is how, sometime in the late 70s, a capsule of cesium-137 fell out of a radiation gauge. The news made its way up the chain, reportedly all the way to Leonid Brezhnev himself, general secretary of the Communist Party. He forbid any pause in construction. The Olympics was going to happen, orphan source or not. A week later, the search for the capsule was ordered stopped. But it wasn't actually lost, it was right under their noses, buried in a tremendous pile of gravel, a nuclear needle in a haystack. This haystack would soon become this specific apartment building in eastern Ukraine. The residents of the newly built Building 7 in modern-day Kramatorsk, Ukraine, were thrilled. The Communist Party had made good on their Olympic plans and delivered something significantly nicer to the region. It was now the early 80s. Over the next nine years, two families would live in Unit 85 of Building 7. Both of them had children. Both of them would place the children's bed against the same wall, in the same room. The wall where a capsule of cesium was waiting silently, encased in concrete. The first family moved into Building 7 in 1981, a mother, her 18-year-old daughter, and her 16-year-old son. The daughter didn't make it a year. The son didn't make it a year after that. The mother died around the same time. They all died of leukemia 
a kind of blood cancer. Rumors in the building started. Gossip. Superstition. Was this a tragic coincidence? Was the building cursed? Their doctors attributed the family's fate to poor genetics, even as the family's neighbors were starting to experience symptoms. The doctor's misdiagnosis, however, wasn't entirely unsurprising, as few could have imagined that what wiped out the entire family was less than a paperclip's mass of cesium, misplaced years ago in a rush to show the West that the Soviet Union knew what it was doing. Why leukemia? Why does radiation cause cancer at all? The pathway is pretty simple. Certain kinds of radiation are ionizing. They have the energy to break chemical bonds and remove electrons from atoms, changing how those atoms interact with each other. Every cell in your body has an immensely complicated double helix of billions of molecules, which are made of ionizable atoms. And changes to this helical information can cause a human cell to die or mutate. So, radiation can cause cancer because if it's ionizing, it can damage DNA and cause the mutations that lead to the disease. But why a blood disease like leukemia specifically? Because radiation is most harmful to cells in the human body that divide more often, as DNA is more vulnerable when a cell is in the process of splitting. The double helix is unzipped into more fragile single strands, and there is less time for any repair mechanisms to kick into action. Significant DNA damage can also alter the splitting process itself in a so-called mitotic catastrophe. Leukemia is particularly associated with accidental doses of radiation because it does a disproportionate amount of damage to the ever-dividing red and white blood cells in your bone marrow. Treating cancer also involves large doses of radiation, beam, isotope, or otherwise, and so it hits dividing cells as a side effect. Most of us unfortunately know or have known someone with cancer, and we know the associated medical struggle, anemia, nausea, loss of hair. Why those specific symptoms? Again, these are the places in the body with the fastest cell turnover, bone marrow, stomach lining, hair follicles. With no diagnosis for the family, and now no tenants for Unit 85, the Kramatorsk Executive Committee gave the keys to the apartment to a new family for a new tragedy. Sometime before 1987, two boys were living with their father and mother in Unit 85. Their bed was pushed up against the wall. A carpet now hung from that wall as decoration. There was a spot burnt into it. No one seemed to notice. Both sons would be admitted to the hospital for leukemia in 1987, and one of them would die. Why were all these young people dying from cancer, and a specific cancer at that? Again, nothing from doctors aside from a diagnosis. The father of the boys, understandably distraught, fought for some kind of investigation, anything. It would be two years before any expert took his grief seriously. Because industrial radiation gauges need to see through dense material like soil and metal, their sources, like cobalt, iridium, and cesium, are intensely radioactive. When misplaced, as they have been many times in the nuclear industry's history, even very recently, they can cause severe tissue damage, even death in Douglas Crowfoot's case, though that may have been history's only recorded radioactive suicide. And so, even encased in the concrete wall of Unit 85, a capsule of cesium-137 is a drop-and-run kind of situation. The isotope both emits beta and gamma radiation. The beta radiation, electrons, are stopped easily. The gamma rays, high-energy photons, are not. They can penetrate into meters of concrete. Hastily built apartment buildings in the Soviet Union are not meters thick. The beds of the four children who passed were placed in a room emitting an estimated 1,800 rentgens of radiation per year. Converting this to another unit for comparison, that's over 2,000 microsieverts per hour. Using three different Geiger counters, I measured the ambient radiation in the room where I myself sleep. It's around 0.05 to 0.1 microsieverts per hour. The unfortunate families were sleeping in an apartment with a rate 41,000 times higher than this. This is a rate comparable to getting a chest x-ray every three minutes 
for a year. It's comparable to sleeping in the hospital basement in Pripyat, where Chernobyl's firefighters ditched their heavily contaminated equipment, and sleeping there night after night, night after night. For at least nine years in Kramatorsk, Ukraine, two families lived in an apartment with rates 100 times higher than what would eventually become the tomb of Chernobyl Reactor No. 4. The second family's grieving father would have to wait two years after holding a funeral for his son in his own apartment before radiologists finally entered Unit 85. They were shocked. Reportedly, even before opening the front door, they realized that they would need better equipment. They returned with radiation meters from the headquarters of civil defense. The rate was highest in the bedroom where all the children had slept, and higher still at the wall the bed was pushed up against. It was immediately clear that this was a cut-and-run situation. Cut out the part of the wall with the highest reading and get it out of the apartment as fast as possible. According to radiologist and physician Nikolai Sevchenko, who was present during that inspection, quote, in order to cut out part of the wall, lead plates were nailed to its area to protect workers. The driver of a sand truck was also shielded with lead plates and an apron, and the truck took the dangerous cargo to the factory laboratory, from where it was taken by specialists from the Kiev Institute for Nuclear Research, end quote. Before the radiologists left Unit 85, they swabbed everything, but they found nothing. Clean. Everything was in a small section of wall on its way to Kyiv. Now in Ukraine's capital, the wall fragment was placed in a hot cell, a shielded box or room where scientists can remotely manipulate radioactive material. Upon the wall's dissection, researchers found a tiny 8 by 4 millimeter capsule. The serial number on it matched the one lost a decade ago in a quarry. The killer inside the walls of Building 7 was caught. Everyone could go back to living their lives, or so the scientists thought. The tenants of Building 7 disagreed. They demanded further examination of their apartments and, if needed, medical care. And so specialists, doctors, and the city executive committee met with the residents of Building 7 in the March of 1990. Again, according to radiologist Sevchenko, who was present, quote, The meeting was held in a tense atmosphere, and it was not possible to completely dispel the distrust of the residents. The meeting was very tragic. Angry cries, tears, all of this understandable, especially considering what had happened a thousand kilometers away just four years before. Chernobyl. Across nine years, a capsule of cesium-137 had killed four people and gave 17 of their neighbors an abnormally high dose of radiation. These 17 were eventually lumped into the same group of so-called victims of Chernobyl for medical assistance purposes. This designation and assistance, however, was canceled three years later in 1993. As to who any of these people were or are, that information appears lost to time. Because the radioactive contamination was completely contained in a capsule, Building 7 wasn't demolished. Only the wall of Unit 85 was removed. In fact, in 2003, reportedly, one of the families was still living in Unit 85. Quote, They still live in that same apartment. They couldn't leave their home, in which they experienced such tragic moments. Already a middle-aged couple who have a future, the future of their daughter, and who do not want to stir up the past. We live with this ampule for nine years, the mother says bitterly. The father is silent. He said everything he needed to 13 years ago. The grief that has befallen our family is immeasurable. As of 2021, Building 7 is still there. Maybe the family is too. On a snowy day in 2001, three men from Leah, Georgia, stumbled across two metal cylinders in the woods. The ground beneath them was steaming. It would take the work of over 50 people and two years of intensive hospital treatment before the radiological incident in Leah was finally over. One of the men would die of acute radiation poisoning. 
he had used a radioisotope thermal generator, or RTG, as a space heater. This was an orphan source, or a source of radiation not under regulatory control, abandoned by the Soviet Union, like the capsule of cesium in Unit 85. It would be nice to say that these incidents were rare. It would be nice to say that useful sources of radiation never hurt anyone. But it wouldn't be true. This paper sums up 50 years of radiation incidents inside former USSR territory. 349 incidents, 71 total fatalities. Almost half of them happened at Chernobyl. It would be easy to take this data and say something about the failure of the Soviet Union, of communism, or even of the nuclear industry as a whole. But this last indictment wouldn't quite be true either. This is a table from that same paper, a list of technology-related accidents inside the Russian Federation in 2000. Statistics from just one year, not 50, slightly more than 71. This is the number of people that have died from fossil fuel pollution-related illnesses around the world just last year. The radiological accident at Kramatorsk was tragic, and we talked about it in this distressing way to yet again highlight what can happen when human error meets political pressure. But I ask you, what is scarier, truly, a radioactive killer like that at Kramatorsk, or the silent killer that we've all chosen to ignore, that we've all decided is just the cost of doing business? Fossil fuel pollution has made more literal orphans than every radiological accident ever in just the runtime of this video. Until next time.